Uh, Greg uh, has graciously offered me a little bit of time to talk to you about nutrition. It's obviously one of my favorite subjects. Um, but it is something that uh, you will need to do as I say and not as I did because I'm a perfect example of what not to do as far as nutrition is concerned. Um, a couple of observations with respect to nutrition. Um, well, before I get started, let me ask, uh, has anyone noticed a difference between what we are teaching here in HAMS and the current um, trend in mountain climbing called fast and, uh, and light? There is a significant difference between those two and what we're teaching you is the methodical, reasonable, and slow way to get up a mountain. It's not the fast and furious kind that uh, many of the climbers today are, are uh, experiencing. Much of my information is, however, comes from the new alpinism. And uh, this is the fast and uh, light method of going up a mountain. Um, this gives you just exactly what you need to do with respect to fast and light. Um, I would recommend it. Uh, however, I'm sure that one of their first exercises in terms of training is carrying this book around the block for three times. Um, it is a uh, tome of, first, of the first order, but it has just about everything you'd ever want to know about alpinism in it. Okay, a couple of observations with respect to nutrition. Uh, nutrition is critical to the success of any climb, uh, and I do mean any climb. If you are not properly uh, energized, you're not going to make it up uh, Iron Mountain, let alone make it up Rainier or Everest. So you need to be properly uh, fed, and uh, you need to be prepared for high altitude uh, problems associated with this. It's uh, um, if what turns out to be uh, necessary as far as food is concerned is uh, a matter of personal preference. Um, you will and should plan and eat what you like. Okay? That's easy enough to say, hard enough to do because you need, to be have, you need to have a balanced diet in order to do that. Um, but it is critical that you like what you have on the mountain and that you are willing to eat it. Uh, I spoke about not, ha not following my example. When we got to 19,000 on top of Aconcagua, I did not have any desire to eat. Okay, so... Um, you literally have to force yourself to eat. And on Aconcagua, that, that I paid the price. Uh, we were locked down at 19,000 by winds, but uh, the lack of nutrition on my part meant that I bonked the next day, even, that was, even though that was coming down off the mountain. So you've got to have proper nutrition, and you've got to have uh, the energy to be able to do what you want to do in the mountains. Poor appetites, fatigue, and exhaustion contribute to the idea that you don't want to eat. So you've got to overcome these. You almost have to force yourself to eat at altitude. Not only do you have to eat at altitude, but you've almost got to eat all the way along the way. Because as we'll talk about a little bit later, you need to eat on the trail in order to have enough carbohydrates to produce the glucose that is required for energy in climbing the mountain. Uh, humans were not designed for multitasking when it comes to nutrition. One of the most important aspects, one of the more important aspects of nutrition is the concept of stomach emptying. You have to get the food out of your stomach into the system before it does any good. Okay, the body tends to uh, retain blood in the digestive system in order to, uh, to enable the uh, digestive system to take place or the digestion to take place. So your blood is not going to your muscles, it's going to your stomach. And uh, as a consequence, uh, you can't do both. You can't uh, be eating a lot and uh, exercising a lot because 
the blood system just won't, uh, won't tolerate that. Blood carries energy f to the cells and carries waste away from the cells. Um, because uh, it is of a certain thickness to do that, if you drink less water, you need, um, you will find that you will not have the energy or uh, reduce the waste in your cells that you really need to. Okay, uh, the best foods for a high altitude you'll, uh, you can eat are um, something that's easy to fix, something that uh, digests quickly, and uh, something that also contains carbohydrates. Eating is a huge problem at altitude. Uh, you need to replace the proteins in your body in order to, um, to repair the cells that uh, the uh, body is breaking down during your exercise. Uh, Mark Twight's solution in his Extreme Alpinism book is to eat uh, or absorb, would be a better way to put it, one goo an hour. Uh, that's not sufficient to provide adequate nutrition during your climb. You've got to have more than that. But more important, we'll talk about it a little, little bit later, the idea is you've got to have the water to be able to move the food around. Okay. Remember that altitude has an effect on the boiling point of water. Okay, so at sea level, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. At 10,000 feet, it boils at 194 degrees Fahrenheit. At 20,000 feet, it boils at 176 Fahrenheit. So that, that not only affects the temperature of your water, but it also affects your ability to cook with that water. So that if you have something that requires 10 minutes to be able to cook and you're at 10,000 feet, it's going to take 40 minutes for you to cook that product. If you're at 20,000 feet, it's going to take you two hours and 10 minutes for the same amount of cooking. So it's an energy um, intensive uh, effect uh, and requirement to be able to get the food uh, to a condition that you can be able to eat it. Okay, uh, you need to eat with a purpose and that purpose is to provide the energy to your body. We are um, told uh, hypothetically that uh, our bodies are made up of about 60% of what we eat and about 40% of the exercise we get with respect to being able to climb. Okay, the components of food in eating uh, are carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. These three need to be um, fed into your system uh, in a reasonably uh, rational manner, and uh, you'll find that uh, your desire to eat is going to be reduced by the amount of altitude that you're at. Uh, British climbers report that at their, um, that they consumed about 4,200 calories uh, per day at the base camp. When they were reaching uh, 19,000 feet, um, they were uh, only eating about 3,200 calories. When they got to 22,000 feet, they were only eating uh, about 1,500 calories. So again, the, you're almost in a position where you have to force yourself to eat with respect to the idea of getting enough nutrition in your body. All right, when you're going off to an expedition uh, to a high mountain, you need to consider nutrition carefully. It's often something that is relegated to the individual if you're planning on doing it yourself or with a partner, it's relatively easy. If you're going to do it with a group, you need to decide whether you're going to do it as a group or whether you're going to do it as individuals. Uh, if you're going to do it with a group, you need to find out what everybody's dietary um, limitations are, what they're allergic to, what they will eat, what they won't eat, what they like. Okay, and uh, the best way to do that is to do a survey of the people that are going with you to find out what their likes, dislikes, and uh, what their limitations are. Then you need to do um, 
meal planning form and you need to decide how long you're going to be on the mountain and uh, at what altitude and what foods are available to you uh, perhaps from the uh, local area. Um, once you've determined this, you can determine how much food you're going to need and begin the planning process of acquiring that food and then preparing it for shipment overseas. Um, you need to estimate the number of days each member will be on the mountain to determine what kind of nutritious, nutrition needs they will have. Planning uh, are the components of food where the carbohydrates are probably the most important uh, portion of the uh, components of food that you will need as you get on the mountain. About 65% of your nutrition needs to be in carbohydrates. Um, this brings up another point with respect to people who might be deciding they want to be on a diet. Uh, diets and mountains do not go together. So don't plan on being on a diet, whether it's a low carb diet or a high protein diet or whatever it is. Uh, you can't afford to be doing that on the mountain. And in fact, most of the time, you're going to end up losing weight on the mountain, whether you uh, are on a diet or not. Okay, the next uh, element of um, the components is uh, proteins. Proteins are important to you when you get on the mountain because uh, they're going to help repair the cell damage that you do in your climbing. Um, finally, fats are also important on the mountain. Uh, they have tended to be ignored in the past, but as a matter of fact, fats are going to provide most of the energy that you're going to need to climb. It's a process of converting the fats that you have in adipose tissue to energy, and that's going to take some uh, carbohydrates to do it. It actually requires carbohydrates to make that conversion. Okay, fats are the fuel for climbing. The average climber has about 2,000 kilocalories of energy stored in the uh, muscles and in the liver. Um, the average, the same average athlete has 100,000 kilocalories of energy stored in adipose tissue. That's the fat of the land. Okay, so you've got it, you just have to convert it, which means that you have to continue to eat carbohydrates because carbohydrates are the kinds of things that, are convert, that convert um, to uh, glucose to be able to provide you the energy. So you need to be, uh, as I said, about 65% of the calories from carbohydrates, about 20% of the calories from fat, and about 15% of the calories from um, protein. Um, the average diet is about two to 3,000 calories per day. That's us here at this altitude. Um, if you are climbing, it's going to be significantly higher. If you can get it down, you need to have as much as four to 6,000 calories per day. Going through the process of making out a menu for a higher altitude, uh, I found it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to try and get to the four to 6,000 calorie uh, re recommendation that they have. So that's the situation where you need to find ways that you can get calories into your diet to, at altitude. Greg, was that a, you want to talk? <coughs> okay. Um, if you're, allocating your calories to different meals, you need to, uh, to allocate about a thousand calories to breakfast. Uh, oatmeal um, that we have uh, here is about 350 calories. So that's not going to provide you sufficient calories to be able to start at your day. During the uh, day on the trail, you're going to, or you should be, eating along the way. The lunch meal consists of anything after breakfast and before dinner, and <laughs> in large quantities. 
each time you stop, you probably ought to eat at least one goo. Um, again, that's Mark Twight's recommendation. Uh, but I would add to that, uh, add something else that includes the carbohydrates. Um, I have become a, um, a fan recently of the uh, Cliff Bars because I've been uh, going through and analyzing what they're, uh, what they're made of and what they provide as far as uh, our ability to get up the mountain. Um, so lunches all day long. Dinner, you need to have about 2,000 calories um, for your dinner and about 1,000 calories for your drinks. So those are the allocations you need to have. And the reason you need to have those allocations is because of a need for insulin. Um, if you think about it, insulin is kind of the key to the door through which the carbohydrates are going to be converted to energy, to glucose. Um, so uh, your body provides insulin and uh, it, is, uh, it is excited or um, activated by, uh, by carbohydrates. After about 60 to 90 minutes of exercise, you're gonna find that you need some carbohydrates to continue converting fat to energy. Um, you need to stop, get a, a cliff bar or goo out and uh, enjoy those as best you can as you move along. Um, you need to consider the stomach emptying problem again and drink water with those. Um, Goo recommends uh, drinking water after taking that and I would strongly recommend uh, water with your Cliff Bar as well. It's a good excuse to be able to get down additional water. Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later. Um, exercise duration. If you are exercising hard, has anyone ever noticed their body giving off an ammonia type smell? Okay, that's actually the conversion of fat to energy. Your body becomes slightly more acidic and uh, you'll smell like you're uh, cleaning the bowl out at home. Um, but that ammonia smell, smell is a good indication that you're now using the fat of the uh, body in order to provide the energy for you. While you're training, um, you need to be experiencing the kind of uh, environment that you need to um, climb the mountain. And uh, in that, you're going to have to, or you should have an opportunity to experiment with various foods. You do not want to go to the mountain with a food that you're not familiar with. You don't know how your body reacts to it. You don't know how well it provides the energy for you. You don't know whether it tastes right or not. And it's important that it tastes right. Okay, so in your training, um, try different kinds of things. Try different flavors of goo, try different uh, brands of, uh, of energy uh, gels, and uh, plan on uh, making your evaluation and uh, taking those things to, that you like to the mountains. Uh, I've already pointed it out, I'll say it again, uh, eat often while you're on the trail. You need to stop uh, at least once an hour and uh, take a goo or a uh, uh, um, energy bar and uh, a little bit of water. Now this may not, in, it may not include a uh, full stop. Uh, you may be kind of on the run uh, and you're going to have to be working together as a rope team to be able to do that. So plan your ascent so that you know when you're going to stop so that you don't have one person stopping and five minutes later another person needs to stop and then the third person needs to stop. You're not going to make it up that mountain that way. So plan on having uh, specific stops uh, so that you know when you're going to be able to relieve yourself or whether you're, or when you're, 
when you're going to be able to get additional energy down and water. Okay, eating while alpine climbing the day before you're going to climb. Um, most of you who have heard the concept of carbo loading. Um, I would recommend carbo loading and hydration loading the day before. You cannot and probably will never carry the recommended amount of water up the mountain to be able to satisfy your body's needs. But you do need to um, be able to get a certain amount of energy in order to keep going. Um, so your, your um, solution to that problem is to go the day before and do some carbo loading and uh, hydrate. Um, Mark Twight in his book recommends that before you start out on a climb, about an hour or two beforehand, you drink a couple of cups of water to get those down so that you're uh, getting additional water in the body that you're not going to have to carry. Um, during the alpine starts, um, they uh, recommended that if you start before 2 a.m., um, and that would be a very early alpine start, if you start before 2 a.m., you really don't want to put anything in your stomach. Take a goo and a glass of tea, and that's about all you want because your body, again, is not going to be able to digest it and move at the same time. If you're going to start after 2 a.m., however, they recommend that you get something solid in your body, uh, whether it be a, an energy bar or a breakfast, uh, full breakfast if you can get it, whatever. But if you do that, you need to have a conversational pace when you start out in the climb in order to allow the stomach to get that breakfast digested and out of the stomach. Okay, um, on the route, uh, about 70 grams of carbohydrates is a good idea. And we'll go through uh, some idea here of what uh, the uh, elements are going to consist of in order to get those 70 grams. If you followed Mark Twight's advice about all you'd need in your pack is goo, um, that's a personal preference on his part and he does fast and light. Uh, my personal observation is uh, one goo per hour is inadequate for the nutrition that you need during your climb. So you need more than that. Um, if you look closely at the goo package, you're going to see that there are about 100 calories in the pack. The carbohydrates, there are 20 grams of that, are about 7% of your daily needs. And the other thing that you want to look at specifically in the mountains is potassium, how much you're getting there, and sodium, because sodium is important for the ability to digest um, the other elements, sugars, vitamin C, vitamin E, probably aren't that relevant with respect to uh, climbing. Okay, um, so goo is a good choice, um, but I uh, looked at, again, the cliff bar, and the way that that stacks up is reasonably impressive. Calories, 250 calories, just from this one bar alone. You'll find that the granola that we'll talk about in a minute is 350 calories, no, 250 calories, okay? So that's 250 calories per serving. There are supposed to be two servings here in here. If you can get both of them down, you've got 500 calories to start with but uh, that would be a uh, fairly um, difficult process, at least as far as I was concerned. Okay, um, fats and where is it? Sugars, dietary, there we go, carbs. About 43 grams here, or about 14%. So you actually get better nutrition 
out of the cliff bar than you do out of, uh, out of certainly out of goo, but also out of the, uh, out of the uh, granola. And it's a whole lot more convenient. While I'm holding this in my hand, it reminds me that you need to be planning what you're going to have during the day. You need to thinking, be thinking about how many of these you're going to need and how many goos you're going to need because these things are going to make bricks in your pack. They will freeze absolutely solid and break your teeth, I can practically guarantee you. So you need to plan for the day to make sure that these are inside your jacket, that they're absorbing some of the body heat and that they are staying uh, edible um, as, they, uh, as you go through the day. There's nothing like getting to the end of the day and finding out that one of the pieces that you have is something that you can't eat. Okay, well, that's on the root. When you get to your, um, your camping spot for the next night, for that night, uh, you need to think about cooking dinner. And again, um, fatigue and uh, uh, your altitude are going to not make you want to prepare your meal. So you've got to have something that's relatively easy to prepare, something that will pro provide you with the nutrition to be able to replenish the energy that your body has used during the day. Um, the, uh, okay, there's granola and there's the backside for granola, 250 calories, carbohydrates, 37 grams. Again, not as much as the Cliff Bar, and uh, protein, eight grams. Okay, on the trail, Cliff Bars, granola. Here's another Cliff Bar. Uh, this one is not as nutritious and not as helpful as far as energy is concerned. This one only has 200 calories rather than the 250 of the other one and the um, Not only my hearing is going, but my sight is going also. There we go, total carbohydrates, 19 grams. So again, it's not quite as nutritious, and I would encourage you to continue to read the labels on these things to find out where you are. If you want to increase the protein in your diet, um, the uh, bison bar is one suggestion. And uh, another one would be a part of dinner that I'll get to in just a second. I went through the um, labels on these relatively carefully to find out what, uh, what it was we'd be able to eat at altitude. Um, this one is a little bit misleading in the sense that it says it has 760 calories in it, but it also has two servings, so that it's only 380 calories for individual servings. Now, to the extent that you could get to altitude, prepare this, and eat the entire thing, yeah, you'll get all 760 calories there. But uh, in theory, uh, it's supposed to feed two different people. There are the nutrition facts on it. 380 per serving, carbohydrates, 48 grams. That's just barely more than the clip bar as far as car carbohydrates are concerned. Gra uh, protein grams, it's uh, a little bit better. But uh, look at the labels on these things to find out what they're going to be doing for you. This is one way to increase the caloric intake and the protein with respect to the food that you're going to eat. This is something that I would add to the um, ranchero that I was just showing you. Instead of making it a vegetarian meal, make it a uh, chicken dinner. This one has a considerable amount of calories in it, but it also, let's see if I can see it here. No, try there. On the back side, it's three and a half servings per container. That just one, one little bag of uh, chicken is three and a half servings. So again, if you can get through that, you uh, have eaten a considerable amount of calories and you're also going to get uh, a better um, 
Well, just calories as much as anything else because look down here. Total carbohydrates, zero. Protein, yeah, 14 grams of protein. But more than anything else, for me, that makes the meal palatable. And I'm more willing to eat it with the chicken on it than I would if it didn't have anything. Tuna is like the chicken. Uh, it comes in a pack. You can just add it to the uh, freeze dry that you have. And again, it's uh, caloric intake is good, 110 for the entire package. But again, it has no carbohydrates. So basically, you're looking for these two items to be able to add protein, which is going to help you repair the cells that you've damaged during the day. OK, any question about uh, eating breakfast, lunch, or dinner? at altitude. Have any of you um, just freeze-dried food and then made your own packets to bring, or have you always done good, more of the mountain house stuff? Good, good place for me to jump in and, and speak my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so I was playing a game earlier here. We could play guess what's in the bag <laughs> and how many servings it is. Um, yeah, I am a huge fan of dehydrating my own food. Uh, I do it for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I'm cheap. Okay, let's, let's go through Bill's meals. Here's breakfast, $5.75. Here's the little tuna packets, probably buck fifty a piece. Cliff bars, buck a piece. Cheese enchilada, that's got to be an eight or ten dollar meal. Okay, um, you're on Denali. Multiply this by 21. That's getting to a few hundred bucks on food. And so you dehydrate your own. It's much cheaper. And you control the flavor. You control the spices. And you can put together various combinations that you like and you try at home. So my guess what's in the bag. Here, I'll just send it around. We'll see who can guess. Um, but, okay, Bill, Bill likes to add tuna. So do I. Um, take out your nice star-kissed cans of tuna. This is about four standard-sized cans of tuna dehydrated and crumpled up. So this has water packed in it. This is four cans, this is four times what's in this, and it weighs less. So, so you can just add the water in the morning? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get there in a second. Uh, because that, that is, there, there is a big difference, that's the one downside that I've run into. Um, so other things, this actually a good friend of mine has her own farm and she gave me some sun-dried tomatoes that were... I just keep my freezer full of stuff. Um, so if I get a sudden trip, I go. Um, this is some of our mystery substance going around. Um, combined in, one of the other things I do, I, instant rice is kind of lacking in nutrition and, and flavor, so I actually dry my own brown rice. And in an effort to get protein in, I've actually just recently gotten very excited about quinoa which has a ton of protein, surprising amount of calories, and weighs nothing. Um, quinoa, it's a South American grain. You can actually get it in bulk at Safeway nowadays. I cook it and then dehydrate it. Um, so as I do with brown rice, I do long cooked brown rice. Um, so I do ground beef. The one thing that doesn't work, poultry doesn't come back easily when you dry it. So I actually invest in some freeze-dried chicken if I'm going to be out for a long time. Um, vegetables do great. I do. I have a tuna casserole that I'll just dehydrate the whole casserole. And it's nice when I'm at home, um, let's say I'm making a big batch of spaghetti and I've got a big batch of spaghetti sauce, I make a double batch and throw half of it in the dehydrator. Uh, and that way, literally, I, the bottom drawer of my freezer is all baggies like this. I just pulled the first three or four that I found. 
Um, and if I suddenly get asked, hey, want to go backpacking this weekend? Great, I've got my food, it's ready to go. Um, so there's also creative ways you can bulk up and put your own extra calories in and different types of things. Uh, so I, I'm a big fan of non-freeze dried, um, doing your own. Uh, the major downside, other than the fact that you just have to know how to cook and you have to be able to deal with food, um, is if you're used to mountain house, pour, pour boiling water in the bag, let it sit for three minutes, eat your food. This is a little longer process. So it usually, my process when I get into camp, um, I boil some water, I make up some ramen to eat. Um, only place I'll eat ramen is on a trip. Um, I'll have a nice cup of tea, and I'll save off the other half of the water while I'm eating the ramen. The other half of the water will be rehydrating my dinner. It usually, I let it sit and soak for about a half an hour. Um, and then I cook it. So jet boils aren't the greatest for this because you actually have to cook sometimes. Um, but if you don't mind doing that, it really, it saves you money, it saves you flavor, and it's a really great way to go, um, in my opinion. Um, I, the only ones of these I've ever eaten is somebody gave them to me. I, I just, um, I say it, it offends my taste buds, and, and actually it's gotten better tasting, but it certainly offends my pocketbook. So, uh, so you're cooking in a pot or something like that. Yeah. You just take snow and, and freeze all the leftovers in the pot. What leftovers? Yes, <laughs> what leftovers? No, I mean it's gonna have slime on the inside of the pot, but you want to. Oh, oh. All right, I'll go there in a second. All right, we've sent this around. Anybody want to tell me what's in this and how many servings? Huh? Ground beef. All right, I got jerky, I got ground beef. Anybody else? Bean bark. Yeah. Green beans. Is that This is approximately 10 servings of spaghetti sauce. Um, what you do is you put it in a fruit roll up tray in a commercial dehydrator. And I, the one step I haven't gone through uh, with this particular batch that I sometimes do is I get it nice and dry and then I throw it in a food processor to put it in to, to pulverize it. Is there, meat um, in there? there is no meat in this yet. I have, I have a separate little baggie for ground beef. Mine like bread. Um, I don't know. Maybe we use a different <laughs> recipe. Um, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I have, can actually make dehydrated meals that you can use, like the Mountain House. Mm -hmm. You do the hot water, boiling water in mm -hmm. it, and then we've made, um, they're like, um, it's just out of the windshield wiper, uh, windshield covers that are mm -hmm. the foils, so they're like foil packs. Okay. So you can put the boiling water in it. As long as they're in a freezer bag, it won't melt the baggie. Mm -hmm. And you tuck it inside that and just clip with a, a beaner across the top, and it'll cook in about 10, 15 minutes. All um, right. So you can speed it up. Right. It's very much the same as a mountain house. Mm -hmm. OK. So anyway, that's uh, some examples of that. I'm right back to, yes, you have to clean a pot. So what, how do I clean a pot? I bring um, a little tortilla wrap and wipe it out real good. <laughs> And then, um, this is one I, I learned from a Marine Corps colonel on the Appalachian Trail, and he showed me this, so I was like, what an awesome idea. Um, you take your toothbrush, you put some clean water in your pot, you scrub it with the toothbrush, and you get all the food remnants, and they end up in the bottom of your pot, you got food and water. So what do you do with food and water? You drink it. So that is how you will see me cleaning a pot works just fine. Um, so it's a little more work. Um, I'll have to try playing with that. Yeah, my problem, some of my stuff comes back at different rates yeah. is, is one of the dilemmas. Um, but there's a lot of things you can do. I'll use, I'll, I'll have ground beef and some vegetables and I'll get mashed potatoes, the commercial mashed potatoes, mm -hmm. and shepherd's pie. You know, really good stuff. The other thing with something like this, if I bring this, I just pour in enough 
for my appetite tonight. I'm not stuck with their portion sizes. So um, that's something that I also really like about this. Uh, on a backpacking trip, I don't usually do it mountaineering because I want to go a little easier, but on a summertime backpacking trip, I bring 10 bags of ingredients on a long distance backpack. And I figure out how I want to combine them on a given night to give myself variety. I'll have a, you know, a spaghetti sauce, I'll have a little white sauce mix, I might have some curry powder with me, I might have some chili powder, I might have some gravy. And you can make three or four different sauces, two or three different meats, a couple of different types of pasta, a few different types of vegetables, and you can just create on a given night. So that's something that I... Okay. So, um, I'm very intrigued because I'm going to need to end this. However, I've heard that it's really hard to dehydrate um, high foil foods, and I just wondering if you... Uh, what, what type of foods? High oil content foods, and we're just wondering if you've had issues getting enough fat into your... Yeah, with, with beef, I go with very lean stuff. I drain it really good, um, but, you know, go with like 90% lean ground beef, for example. Get really lean stuff. Um, but I haven't had big issues with it. Um, I'll even, I've done another one that, that, that's worked well for me is I'll make chili and put that and dry that up. And things come back at different rates and you kind of got to get used to it. You know, I know I've sold somebody on this and he was used to the mountain house and he got back from a trip and he did not take Bill's advice and where he was using food he had never tried before. And he didn't know how to cook it and he came back and screamed at me that I made him eat raw, horrible food. I said, no, you just didn't cook it long enough. Um, so that's one of the big things, you, you know, just like you don't take a piece of equipment up on a mountain without having tried it, you don't take food up on a mountain without knowing how it's going to work and experimenting. Do you find you need to bring more fuel with you with the longer cooking versus um, plan for more weight? Not horribly. Um, I use a lot of different things to, to conserve fuel. And so, I, I've no, I haven't noticed that I'm running out when other people aren't. So that's a, a good question. As far as the multi-fuel stoves go, is there a fuel that you get more efficiency out of? White gas, gasoline? White gas. Mm -hmm. white uh, gas. Yeah, white gas, it, for, for winter time, cold weather use, white gas is the fuel of choice up to about 19,000 feet, after which it gets really hard to ignite. So then you switch over to isobutane. Um, basically, you know what, I, at this point I know a lot of people who love isobutane, who love their jet boils and that kind of thing, and use them in Alaska, and use them when it's cold. And if you're real careful about keeping your canisters warm, those stoves can work just fine. I think the last time we did a Rainier trip, we were about 50-50. Um, but I, I, I still love my white gas stoves. Um, I mean, with multi-fuel, you have some choices. So yeah. Still white gas is the best. Yeah, definitely. If you're really ultralight for winter time, I still I wouldn't do an alcohol stove. Um, that's the only thing in winter. No way. What about like fuel availability in other countries? All right. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> um, typically. If you are going to a mountain that's known and you've got an, an industry around it, um, use Aconcagua as an example, in Mendoza, Argentina, you can find anything you need. Um, these days, it, I've been to Ecuador three times. The first time I went was somewhere around 2000, yeah, it was 2001. Um, the first time I was in Ecuador, we filled our fuel bottles at the local gas station. Um, the last time I was in Ecuador, you could buy white gas from anybody around and there were canisters readily available. Uh, when I was in Russia in 2000, we
got fuel into our stoves. It was the dirtiest, grossest stuff I had ever used. We siphoned it out of the vehicle that we got to ride to the trailhead in. That was our fuel. So if you're getting a stove, you're planning to do international stuff, multi-fuel uh, makes a difference. Make sure you can burn crap because if you're in a third world country, you might be burning, you might be burning leaded regular for all you know. So the white gas canisters, you can basically put anything in them and they'll just burn it? Um, well, if the stove is a true multi-fuel stove, it will. You might, I had some clogging issues in Russia. Um, I had to clean that sucker room a lot. Uh, like every meal, I was cleaning my stove after um, because that was just horribly dirty fuel. But like paint all through the head? Is that what gets all? Yeah. Out? Yeah. So you know, if you've got a shaker jet, but you want to carry a good fuel cleaning, sometimes I was cleaning the line. Um, how do you know how many calories you have in each of those? Okay, there, there's kind of two approaches to this. Um, there's I, the scientific approach where you dutifully check the label on every single thing and you add up how much you're putting in and you divide it and you figure out the nutrition content for absolutely every single thing. And you know, if Tiger did this, he'd have it in a spreadsheet. <laughs> um, he doesn't, so he doesn't have it. I'm not that compulsive, so I say, well, okay, that's, yeah, that's got some calories, I'll throw that in. Well, that tastes good, I'll throw that in. Um, so, so kind of I kind of I kind of go through time and experience of, yeah, this will be enough. Um, but, I say, there, there are those who would find my approach a little problematic, um, some of whom I can't with. <laughs> Do you have any advice on estimating like fuel consumption as you go up in altitude and different things like that so that you can prepare to have the right amount of fuel to melt water and cook and everything? Yeah, actually we, we will talk about fuel consumption as we're getting into field sessions. Let me see if I can quote it for white gas. Um, I usually go... All right. Do you know what off the top of your head, white gas, is it three ounces per person per day? No. I or four ounces? Um, yeah, I think in the winter time we're looking at three to four ounces per person per day. Uh, don't quote me on that today. I will have the stat for you next week when I'm talking about trip preparation. Um, I don't know it well for isobutane because I don't usually use it, um, but there are statistics out there. Um, what you're dealing with is, uh, particularly for isobutane, the colder it gets, the less efficient that is. Um, you go to extreme lengths, um, having used it at 24,000 feet, at extreme lengths to boil a liter of water. Um, you're doing crazy things like holding the stove canister close to the stove so the stove canister will warm up enough that it'll run the stove hotter. And then when the stove gets hotter, you pull it away, and you're playing this game the entire time. Um, you do some really silly things to keep things efficient. But you get used to sleeping with your canisters if you use isobutane. Um, and white gas, um, you know, thinking Aconcagua again, um, you know, the wind was taking an awful lot out of my fuel. Even in my best fuel, I was getting a lot of wind. So. Um, the fuel, if you're going to take extra of something, fuel is not a bad thing to do. And then just one more, like, what are the opinions between you two on, like, real food versus, like, goose and bars, you know, like, that whole argument between real food and mm -hmm. uh, produced food? Uh, go. <laughs> take your first <laughs> left building. Point <laughs> counterpoint. Uh, the argument between like real food and uh, like goo food, like where do you stand on that? Yeah. Taste-wise, I always prefer real food, obviously. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, and we just went through it, the energy that you can get out of some of the bars is equal to some of the energy you're going to get out of, re most of the energy you're going to get out of real food. Okay, so as a practical matter, if you're a purist and you like uh, to eat the food that you like, then by all means bring it. 
but in terms of uh, your efficiency, you're probably going to be better off with goo and with, uh, with energy bars. Okay, my, my thought, um, like so many things, it depends. We'll talk a little bit about it when we do trip planning next week. What style are you doing the mountain in? And what sacrifices of comfort are you willing to make to do what kind of things on the peak? Um, when I was on Denali, um, we ran into the only other people we saw on our route were on the way down. Um, to uh, climbers Sun, Sun Na and Karen McNeil, um, a very accomplished uh, team of women climbers who unfortunately died about two years after I met them on Denali. They were heading to do the Cassine Ridge, which is one of the harder technical climbs on Denali. And I looked at their packs, and they, they did not have a lot of gear at all. And we, were, we asked them, what, you know, what are you carrying? Um, they were carrying goo, ramen, and a whole lot of fuel, fuel, and that was it. And they also told us, um, they, they were serious about their ultralight alpinism, they said, we figure this trip will take us somewhere around six or seven days, we've got five days worth of food. Mm -hmm. um, they got into some trouble, it took them nine. When we hit high camp, we, we, we contacted the rangers, we were able to, for the first time, to hear the Rangers radio broadcasts. They were calling constantly, looking for somebody on the Cassine Ridge. And the next day, we saw rescue helicopters looking for them. And we were kind of freaked out because we were like, "Well, we were the last people to see these folks." Because they were, they were immediately um, when we were coming up the West Rib, and, and when you get to high camp on the West Rib, is when you finally get in radio contact with the Rangers and it's mandatory on Denali you have a ranger band radio. Um, when they got us, they immediately asked, did you see these two? Where were they? What were they doing? How long ago? Because um, they, they were late. Um, luckily, they, they came out okay. And they had just completed the all, first all-female ascent of the casino. But for me, I don't know that I could do five days of Gulen Ramen. You know, I, it's just, it it's all fits into your goals and your, and your style and your purpose. Um, I want some real food. When you get to extreme altitude, as Bill was talking about, you lose your appetite. So you better have something you like with you. So yeah, I'll carry chocolate bars and M&Ms. No, that's not the best use of weight. But sometimes <laughs> I can eat them. And you can't eat anything else. Um, just to give you... And this one always works. For people who know me know how serious this is. When I did Mount Shishapangma going to 8,000 meters, um, I walked off that mountain with four chocolate bars in my pack. That has never happened in the history of any climb I have ever done. It, it just because I couldn't eat, I couldn't even eat a chocolate bar. Somebody had given me a really special chocolate bar to eat on the summit. I didn't even take it in my pack. Um, on summit day on Shishapangma, camp was at 24, we got up to 26.3. I ate a cliff bar for breakfast. It took me 45 minutes to get it in my body. It, I had to force every single bite. Um, I had a lot of water. I had a big, big cup of tea. Um, and I ate three and a half goos over the course of the day. Um, the half is because I was going to puke if I ate one more little shot of goo. Um, but at serious altitude, frequently, goo is the only thing I can get down in my body. Um, so I love other snacks, but I, it just wasn't going to get in there. Um, I really like carrying like real apples or like real mm -hmm. like, produce. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just take, it takes good. Yeah. Um, have you run? In, have you ever brought or run into problems bringing real produce at high altitude? Um, basically, it's o weight and pressureless. Huh? Overseas, yes. You yeah. do not eat anything that you cannot peel. Yeah. Um, yeah, but overseas is actually when I want to bring some real food because man, South America, you can get some great stuff. Um, 
You just got to make sure you clean, you know, clean the exterior. Uh, the issue is it getting beat up in your pack. Um, the issue is weight, and, and um, but you know it's a trade-off: weight versus the pleasure it gives you. And th there, there's a lot to be said for feeding your psychological needs. Um, you know, you got to do without some comforts because you can't get anywhere if you bring everything. But you got to make some serious choices about that. And sometimes finding some cool local food. Um, you know, if you're going someplace like South America, I showed you guys slides of Bolivia. The cook brought in. He's not gonna. He's not gonna bring in American food. He brought in local stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, we had, we had dried llama meat. It was interesting. Um, you know, in, in Tibet, we had yak. And we had a lot of lentils. You know? um, when we went to Tibet, Mike brought three or four mountain house meals because he wasn't sure, he wasn't sure enough about what we were going to get served cooking. Um, but yeah, sometimes I'll bring local stuff, you know. Um, go over to Switzerland, you buy some really good cheeses, you know. Swiss chocolate, yeah. Bring it in. Um, right. what, what is your feeling with caffeine consumption? Since a lot of the goos and we'll gels. We'll talk about caffeine in a minute. Okay. okay. Um, do you have a thought um, on the pros and cons of like cured sausages and stuff? Because you know, in the Alps, everybody has some sort of yeah. Mm -hmm. I, Again, it gets into, you know, it's, it's heavy, it's fatty, it's hard to digest. Uh, you get into what Bill's talking about with how will it leave your stomach and how soon. Uh, it, so much of it depends on how long is the trip. It, is it something you normally eat that your body's used to dealing with? Uh, there's a lot of variables in there. Off the top of my head, I wouldn't take it, but I don't eat it normally. So... But if you normally, well, what's the shelf life on if you don't vacuum pack it a cured of a meat that, that you'd have? How long would you keep it around before you'd be concerned it could potentially uh, go bad? Um, if it, the dehydrated stuff? Dehydrated meat. Yeah. Um, theoretically, forever. Yeah. If you've dehydrated it well and you don't let it con come in contact with water. So it's so um, vacuum seal it at all? Or no? No. I mean, this is. This is I happen to leave it in my freezer because it's out of the way, but this is how stuff is packaged. I just, and you know, the longest I've had it out, I first started dehydrating food when I hiked the Appalachian Trail many years ago, and my logistics person was sending my meals out probably a month before I got to them. They were sitting in a post office waiting for me. There are expiration dates to Mountain House. Be real careful about what you choose to take with you. Why don't we take a break? <laughs> <laughs>